What's up, my family? Listen, first time listener, or you've been here the whole damn time. Hit that like, hit that subscribe, giddy up, let's go. No notes. That's my I'm baby. Done. I'm done. I'm done. That's my baby. We're going at it at 110. <laughs> I just want five minutes of happiness, please. Just give Don't me five me. minutes. And they, they scored. They did it. What? What the hell was that? Oh yeah. What the f are you talking about? Hey there. Hi there. Hello there. We're back again on a Friday afternoon. Day after Thanksgiving with one more edition of Bowen on the Birds here on A2D. The Eagles have a short week after one of the longest periods uh, I think uh, any of us have ever sat through between their Dallas win and uh, last Monday night's uh, victory over the Kansas City Chiefs. Now suddenly we're faced with another game already. Uh, the Buffalo Bills are coming to Lincoln Financial Field. And toward that end, I have my first guest, Ryan O'Halloran from the Buffalo News. Uh, very astute observer of the Buffalo scene. Let's get him up here. Hello, Russ. There he is, just like magic. How are you, Ryan? I'm good, good. Thanks for reaching out. Good to talk to you. Well, thank you very much for doing this. But I'm going uh, to make you uncomfortable right off the bat, I'll, but I am kind of kidding. You did something two weeks ago that I was shaking my head. I was like, don't, no, 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 because I've done it, and I was always wrong. You declared the season over <laughs> Again, after the loss uh, to Denver. Uh, Bill's season over, and it, last week it didn't look so over. Uh, so where are we now with that? <laughs> I, I, I'm sticking with it, and uh, okay. you know, they they had played so poorly yeah. during that six game stretch, two and four record. They were out of the playoff pick, uh, out of the playoff seating. Mm -hmm. They were picking up injuries left and right on defense, and you know you sort of like like you less you sort of lean on the eye test, but you also got to back it up a little bit and just look at the Bills' schedule. It's at Eagles, by at Chiefs. Home to the Cowboys at the Chargers. The Chargers are a mess, but they're going to be able to score points. Right. So those are four tough games, and that's really what I based it on. Is yeah, this team wasn't playing well enough to be considered any kind of contender, and that's right. that's still the case after they beat the totally awful Jets. Well, the totally awful Jets beat the Eagles, so <laughs> I, you know, well, we lost. Meanwhile, Rob Povia says. Happy Turkey Day. Thank you. Co Turkey Coma Day. Yeah, this is more like what this is today. But uh, but yeah, the, uh, the the Jets were a better team, I think. And I think the Eagles kind of screwed that game up. But yeah, it was uh, the Jets have, have really hit the skids. And, uh, you know, it was a what, 32 to six last week. Really impressive uh, against that Jets defense. I thought that was a lot of points. Yeah. They, 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 but the uh, I know one of the things you're looking at is. Bills are what three and five in the conference. Uh, they haven't they haven't uh, lost outside the conference, I guess. But three and five something like that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what that's. I mean, this game is obviously Can important for the Bills. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you were saying this bill is important. This game. Yeah, it's important because, I mean, they, they, they have a they have a buyer after this game. And I think they got to win one of the next two. They got to either steal the game at the Eagles or steal the game at the Chiefs, which has been a matchup they've, they've had success in in the regular season. Then you can at least start thinking about getting one of those wild card spots. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's – uh, you know, this isn't a be all end all game for the Bills, even though they, it may may sound like it because of their record. But but you mentioned that ego jet game is every team that feels like has one of those games. And unfortunately for the Bills, they've had a couple of those games at New England, which they lost in the last 10 seconds and Denver, they last at the buzzer. So it's just a matter of, OK, making sure those kind of losses don't stack up. That's what the Eagles have done. That's what the Bills haven't been able to do. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the Bills uh, perplex me. In that you've out they've outscored opponents by 104 points. 
<laughs> so far this season. That's a lot to be six and five. It is, and you know they've lost all one possession games, so they've lost close games, and they have destroyed the Raiders, the Dolphins, the Commanders, now the Jets. So, you know that works. Okay, is it a is it a team that knows how to handle a team when they're better, or is it a team that can do that, but also when they have to punch up in class, they don't have what it takes to win that in a, win a close game. I mean, you compare the the, the Bills' record in, in one possession games. To Philadelphia and Kansas City since the start of last year, the Bills are under 500. Those other teams are well above 500. I see. Okay. Well, give me a sense of what the injury situation is. I know you had some concussed cornerbacks coming out of last week, and that's not a good thing going into the Eagles. That's one thing you need against the Eagles is cornerbacks. Yeah, and so mixed bag of injury news today for the Bills. Uh, Dane Jackson, their number three outside corner, he's out with a concussion. Um, Taylor Rapp, their third safety, and they've used him a lot in dime in the last month. He's mm-hmm. out with a neck injury. Good news on Nickelback, uh, Taron Johnson. He's been cleared. Um, okay. But they're okay at corner right now. Uh, Christian Benford, the, the Villanova uh, alum, he was coming back from a hamstring injury. So he's going to start okay. as he did pre-injury along with Rasul Douglas, who they got at the trade deadline from Green Bay. So Ooh. they're okay with their 11, but they can't really afford any more injuries at corner. Understood, yes. Well, Rasul is somebody we know pretty well around here, and he had a heck of a game last week. And I saw that the Bills were using him in press a lot, which was something Jim Schwartz didn't do a whole lot here. And Rasul, you know, he doesn't have a lot of long speed uh, for an outside corner. And uh, I always felt he's a very physical, very big corner, very aggressive corner. I always felt, you know, that guy should be playing press. And lo and behold, there he was playing press and doing very well. You know, and when they made this trade, you call around and say, tell me about this player. And and two people use the same word, gambler. Well, Mm -hmm. that works both ways. When you have a 20-point lead, you can gamble and uh, undercut a route. But I think think it's been a good addition on a couple of fronts. One – he has term left on his deal, so he, he'll probably be here next year, which is what they needed to add for that third-round pick. And then the second thing is they just they didn't have – since the start of last year, they haven't had corners who have been around the football a lot, either yeah. tip passes, intercepted passes, fumble recoveries. He's checked a couple of those boxes just already. So I think a good move uh, by Brandon being the GM uh, last month because they lost Tredavious White in week four. Yeah, they, and that's one of the things I wanted to get to. They are – not the team you expected going into the season. It's White, it's uh, Matt Milano, and there's somebody else, a defensive tackle, I think. Uh, Dick Quinn Jones. Yeah. Uh, so it, has this been the team you expected to see when the season started? No. I mean, offensively, I'll start on offense, even though we mentioned the defensive guys. Mm-hmm. On offense, it's, this, it's, been, it's been uneven. Um, do they want to run it? Are they just run it, running it to appease the head coach? Why can't a number two receiver emerge? Dalton Kincaid, the tight end as a rookie, has been good. You know, mm-hmm. those reasons are why we why we saw a coordinator change last week. Yep. But on defense, the Matt Milano injury was was a lethal because he does so many things. And you know, to illustrate how good Milano is, they've started Tyrell Dotson at his spot. They've started Dorian Williams at his spot. They've taken them off the field and sub package to add a third safety Jordan Parr closer to the line because there's not one guy that did everything that Milano can do. So the, defensively on the plus side for them is they're stopping the run a little bit better. Their numbers mm-hmm. early in the year, they just gave up way too many explosive carries. Maybe the turnover train will be back on the track this week after four against the Jets as well. And they're second in the league in sacks. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, that that's really notable. I mean, they've had a very good uh, pass rush. You don't get a lot of time to throw. Uh, you can run on the Bills, though, right? Is that the case? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's kind of like the the Broncos defensive statistics a couple of weeks ago. They were the, the the numbers were so awful the first month of the season. Is is they're always going to stay in that range? even mm-hmm. if they are better. So the, the, I think the Bills are 29th in yards uh, allowed per carry, but they've done a lot better in, in limiting those 20, 25-yard runs in the last month or so. Yeah. And I think, you know, Linval Joseph, the former Eagle, he signed here uh, a couple weeks ago. He signed on a Thursday. 
played on a Sunday. I mean, you talk about like a marvel at 35 years old. So he's helped that interior because Jones was having a terrific season when he uh, tore his peck against the Jaguars. Yeah. And Linval did that last year, you know, just showed up and played and was very effective for the Eagles. Uh, as was Adam King Sue, who did the same thing. The Eagles had a lot of injuries uh, last year on their defensive line. And uh, that really firmed things up quite a bit for a team that got to the Super Bowl. So, yeah, Linval Joseph is a guy I have a lot of respect for, really. Uh, we were talking about Rasul a few minutes ago. Rasul started out here. He's he's a tough guy. And uh, I I always enjoyed talking to him. I enjoyed uh, watching him. But he, he has his limitations. And I, fans here always wanted to see him move to safety. <laughs> but – one day the secondary coach just finally acknowledged to us, you know, that usually they'll just say, well, we have, they won't give you any reasons why this wouldn't work. And finally the secondary coach one day says, you know, his, to move him to safety or to, to nickel corner, he'd have, which was another thing fans also talked about. He'd have to be much better of a lateral movement than he is. You know, he's more of a straight up and down kind of guy. Uh, so I, I, you know, from what I saw last week, they got him doing the right kind of things. What was it? Two interceptions and a fumble recovery. Is that what he had? Yep. Yep. And then he had a fumble recovery in the previous game. So, you know, there's, there's something, some guys just there around the football. Yes. So, uh, Stefan Diggs, heck of a year. Um, a lot of catches, maybe not quite as many yards as you'd like to see from that many catches. Was it 77 catches? Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. What do you make of his season? Well, it's it's uh, he was very consistent up until about two weeks ago, and and so the well is run dry for him the last two games in those explosive catches, which is like mm-hmm. at least sixteen yards. He had nineteen in the first nine, none in the last two. I think I think, I think they Joe Brady, the new play caller, if he hasn't done already, he needs to go back to the drawing board a little bit with Steph because Stephon Diggs can do a lot of stuff well. He's not a he's not a bubble screen guy because yeah. you know that you know I want him running deep in cuts, deep outs, go routes, just get him moving north where he can win a 50-50 ball. Or in the case of the Jet game, he drew three penalties. So yeah. Yeah. so you know he he is clearly the number one target and he'll remain that way. But Dalton Kincaid, the rookie first round pick, he's emerged since Dawson Knox, the veteran tight end got hurt with wrist surgery. So, mm-hmm. but I, I almost think unless you've seen this probably a, a hundreds of times in pro football is they try and overcorrect. Yeah. And so I would think on the script on Sunday, I think you're going to see uh, a steady diet of uh, 17 to 14. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, I have a lot of other things I want to get to, but I think we need to go to commercial here, and then I will uh, talk to you about your new offensive coordinator and all that kind of stuff on the other side, Ryan. Gotcha. Royal Billiard and Recreation, proudly celebrating 40 years and our new, bigger showroom. Twice the size and twice the fun. More pool tables by Olhausen. More dartboard sets, including custom-reclaimed backboards. More bar and kitchen stools that can change a room. And more bars, including pre-built and custom. Hot tubs, skee-ball, shuffleboard, outdoor, and fun. Royal Billiard and Recreation, your ultimate game room store. Now located on Bethlehem Pike in Colmar. In our family, food is our daily bond. My nonna, affectionately called mama by many, found solace and joy in the kitchen, sharing her love through delicious creations. She turned her culinary passion into a flourishing business alongside her husband and sons in 1983. Celebrating 40 years is a testament to our exceptional team, friends, family, and beloved customers. With gratitude, we look forward to the future, expanding our brand to share the highest quality Italian food and wine nationwide. Our heartfelt thanks to everyone who has played a part in our story. Grazie mille. Hello, we're back with a second segment of Bowen on the Birds on a Friday afternoon right after Thanksgiving. And we're talking to Ryan O'Halloran from the Buffalo News. And I wanted to get into a huge change the Bills made after that Denver loss. Uh, they fired the offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey. And at the time, a lot of the commentary was like, well, you know, this guy's just taking the fall. Uh, 
there's nothing that he's done here that's that bad. But then they scored 32 points against the Jets with Joe Brady running the offense. And uh, I don't know, maybe that uh, initial take was wrong. What do you think? Well, I was probably the one who made that help make that take. I think it was a scapegoat, collateral damage, fall guy, whatever you want to do. I mean, this offense was top 10 in a lot of categories when Ken Dorsey was fired. Um, Josh Allen said, put this one on me. Well, we did. And, you know, but I think Sean McDermott um, was looking to save the season, say, hey, on a short week, use that jet game to sort of get your house in order offensively, establish some things of what you want to do, you know, scheme-wise, concept-wise, so you're ready to go into a much difficult uh task against Philadelphia before their bye week. I mean, I think Sean probably, he, he saw the bye week two weeks away. He said, I can't wait that long, you know, 500 record. But I think, you know, when you have in-season coordinator changes, the knee-jerk reaction is they're rearranging deck chairs. Um, Joe has play calling experience with Carolina. It did not go well. He was fired in season two years ago by Matt Rule. Yes. And so, you know, you're sort of you're sort of looking at the things from Sunday's game. Okay, did they use Monroe on their center? Maybe did they use more motion? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, did they emphasize the run a little bit? Like the score dictated that they were able to do that. Right, right. But uh, you know, I, I think with each week, you know, Joe's going to be able to add a little bit more of his stamp, even though it remains Ken Dorsey's uh, playbook. That's interesting, and and we you were never able to talk to Ken probably about all this. I would guess. No, nope, no. Nope. Uh, it never, uh, never happens, does it? it? It would be fascinating if it did. Well, yeah, you'll run into him in Indianapolis next February, and he'll tell you all kinds of great stuff. Yeah. Well, that's why Gus Bradley uh, belongs in my Hall of Fame. Is he did a press conference. He got fired in season in Jacksonville. He did a press conference the next morning at a hotel. And so uh, I, I'm forever indebted to that. Yeah. But, yeah, like, like I, my, uh, my sports center said, any chance of getting anything from Dorsey? I said, I'm over for my career. Yeah, I've fired coordinators, but right. but he'll reemerge somewhere. He's a good coach. I think he should get a coordinator job next year. Yeah, I think there's a good chance. Well, Joe Brady, interesting guy. Uh, I had a son who was in grad school at LSU when they had the great year with them running the offense there. And, you know, at the time, that guy was the hottest name in, in offensive football. Uh, and he went to Carolina and it didn't go well. What do you make of Joe Brady and his ideas? What do you know enough about it yet to to have an opinion? Yeah, and, and that LSU with Joe Burrow, Jamarcus mm-hmm. Chase or uh, Jamar Chase, excuse me. It's almost like if 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 you're advising Joe Brady after that year, why Carolina? Yeah, yeah. And I know there's only 32 of those NFL coordinator jobs, but he probably would be a Power Five head coach right now at the college level. But like a lot of guys, you want to give the NFL a shot, so. Hey, setback with Carolina. I mean, his quarterbacks were Teddy Bridgewater and I think Sam Darnold. So yeah. you're 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 climbing uphill there. But right. I think he came to the Bills, and one thing he told me last year was it was sort of just a breath of fresh air to be at a position coach level at the NFL, which he never had been. Yeah. With the Saints, he is a quality control guy, and all of a sudden he goes LSU to Carolina. So what what you know, Josh Allen has spoken very highly of Brady even before this, in terms of. Uh, the ways he's helped him. So, I mean, I think I think they, they made the Joe Brady hire last year because they thought if Ken Dorsey has a good year or two, he'll leave to become a head coach like Brian Dayball did. Well, he left, just not on his own choice. Yes, exactly. Let's talk a little about Sean McDermott. I know Sean. Uh, he was in a very tough situation here when uh, Jim Johnson died and Sean became his successor, his defensive coordinator. And he was a very young guy at that point. And there were some veterans who just didn't want to hear from this guy. He was he had a very kind of harsh manner in some ways. And guys like Asante Samuel were kind of like, who's this dude who played at William and Mary, you know, giving me, you know, this little guy, uh, you know, who's he? And they really they got him fired, <laughs> you know, eventually. He, and his units were doing OK, but. There were veterans in the locker room who just weren't going to listen to this guy. And then he went to Carolina and did a tremendous job uh, as defensive coordinator there. And then he went to Buffalo, and he's been there quite a while as head coach. And he's done a lot of good things. I mean, when you look at Bill's eras, 
you know, this is more success than the Bills have had uh, sustained success in quite a while, maybe since Marv Levy. But I, I guess there's a lot of grumbling these days because they haven't really gotten where they need to be to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and uh, I remember yeah, that was kind of the Andy Reid experience in Philly was a little bit like that. You know, they kept getting close and not getting there. And people really soured on Andy. Uh, who turned out to be a pretty good head coach nonetheless. But uh, so Sean McDermott, what, where are we with him in Buffalo right now? Well, you know, the Bills had not made the playoffs for 17 years before he was hired. Yep. They overachieved in 2017. Then they trade up to take Josh Allen in 18. Okay, you hit on the quarterback. But everything is measured in this league, like every pro sport, what you do in the postseason. This team right now is on its third it's, – it's in line for its third consecutive year of regression from the AFC title game yeah. to losing a second-round game on the road to losing a second-round game at home to not may, maybe not making the playoffs or squeezing as a wild card. That's a concern. Yeah. McDermott took over the defensive play calling this offseason from Leslie Frazier, said, hey, you know, it's my defense. I'm going to run it. Hey, mm-hmm. good for you. And I told him that. You're the head man. If you want to do it, do it. Uh you know, beset by injuries, which has probably impacted what the stuff he wants to call. Uh, but this is a team right now. If if Sean McDermott was after the year, Sean McDermott was no longer the coach of the Jets or the the Bills, and you wrote like a recap of his tenure, it'd be the what if game. You know, thirteen seconds against Kansas City. Yeah. Um, oh. getting, getting uh, you know, get get getting handled at home by Cincinnati in the playoffs, blowing a game to the Patriots. That's like the Eagles. Get, losing to the Jets yeah. this year. So all these little things, okay. And, you know, one of the things that became a, a good narrative and, and you know, I talked to players about it is, is he as uptight in public, in private as he is in public? Because it felt like the team was playing tight during that, during yeah. that two and four streak. And, you know, he made the coordinator change. So he signed through 2027. That means a lot, or it could mean nothing. I think it means a lot. Uh, him okay. and Brandon Bean. So, I think his sustained success in the regular season the last couple of years will buy him a year in 2024, even if this season doesn't end well. You know, one thing I remember about Sean, I wanted to bounce this off of you. This was a very long time ago, and he might have changed totally. But one problem I had with him as coordinator, he would be really high on a player and say that you know a lot of times coaches are very measured in the way they talk to us about players he would be like oh this guy yeah we've got this guy he's wonderful he's and the guy would have like a couple bad games and a month later he'd be on the practice squad Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah and i would be like sean you know he said macho harris was going to be a great corner what happened ernie sims you know he was the shark in the water in training camp and now you don't want to put him on the field uh you know is he like that in Buffalo? Well, I think he is a little bit because you just see guys' roles change from week to week. Yeah. And it's that it's not that much of a matchup league. I mean, you make it to the NFL because you can play against all offenses, either mm-hmm. coverage or the offensive tackles and you pass rush against them. So, you know, it's it's interesting you brought that up. Is he does he probably has learned his lesson in terms of saying that. Yeah, but you can just tell by the snap count breakdowns that okay, this guy went from forty something to twenty something, and he was healthy. Okay, so right. and, and that's one of the things. Once that's one of the things he likes to do with rookies is he doesn't want to play him a, a lot, but he has to. So he'll take him in and out of the lineup, and they'll be searching for other options at that position. But one of the interesting things is is is, is Kyrie Elam was a first round corner last year. He was a healthy scratch. Now he's stashed on IR. Okay, where's the disconnect there? Mm. And because you cannot miss on that, yeah. and that's that sets you back because you have now you have got to trade for Russell Douglas. So, uh, you know, uh, be interested to see uh, what 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 he thinks of this defensive personnel after he's called it for a year. It certainly will, yes. But I tell you, I think uh, this game. My my agree or disagree question this week for my audience is. Uh, I really think this is a sort of sneaky uh, must win for the Eagles because you're looking at 49ers and Cowboys yeah. <laughs> and, and Seattle, uh, you know, after this. And uh, even though they have the two game lead in, in the 
we're talking about top seed, you know, obviously not, not about getting into the playoffs, but even though you have the two game lead, you know, you lose this week and it, it's all, uh, it's, it's an uphill fight. I think <laughs> if you win this week, then, you know, you can screw around a little bit and maybe lose a game or two here and there. Um, uh, how do you feel about that? I know you don't look at things from the Eagles point of view, but since that is my question, I thought I'd bounce it off of you. Yeah, I do think it's important for the Eagles for those reasons. You know, San Francisco is going to be coming to town next week and they're going to have three extra yeah. days of rest. Right. And the 49ers, they always get injured, but it looks like right now they're relatively healthy. So that's a challenge. And, and hey, you've made the East Coast the Seattle trip enough. Yeah. That is, I don't care if the Seahawks are playing nine men on the field. That's always it's always a tough place to play. So if you're yeah. the Eagles, you gotta look at every home game in particular as a must win and say, hey, just just keep that cushion above the other teams. Cause getting that first round by is is the end all right now. I mean, yes, it really you can, is. You can it was so important out. last year. You yeah. know, it, you're looking at like teams it, it, you talk about all these great teams, you know, all the in, in the NFC. The reality is, if you get that top seed, you don't have to worry about all those teams. They're going to play each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll have to beat one of them probably, but you'll you'll get somebody in the in your first game that isn't one of these top teams, and then in the NFC Championship game, you'll get whoever survives. So you know, it's it's not like you're going to have to run this gauntlet in the playoffs. Even though, even if you have to do it in the regular season, but you're certainly right about Seattle. Uh, the only time I saw the Eagles win there was 2002, uh, and now they don't play there very often, obviously. Yeah. But uh, nothing has gone well for them in that stadium, which is my favorite stadium in the league, by the way. I don't know how you feel about it, but no, I'm it's a great, it's yeah. it's a great, great place to visit. Uh, so, and and, and and then you flip it to the Bills side, they're in the same boat because the record is poor. But their schedule is, is difficult as well. So it's I, I expect two teams that are really going to slug it out on Sunday. Uh, hopefully the weather is not too bad of an issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, whoever comes out of that game a winner is going to feel good about themselves and should. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And uh, I think it ought to be a really good game. I think both teams are uh, – I think the teams are well matched. I think uh, – the Eagles sometimes have problems with teams that can get pass rush pressure. Uh, I think uh, the Bills probably are going to have a hard time shutting down the Eagles offense uh, if they don't get tremendous pressure on Jalen Hurts. Um, you know, I think the Eagles defense is vulnerable over the middle, but usually they can shut down one receiver if that's kind of what they have to do. Um your running game might be interesting. I know Cook, I don't know much about him as a runner, but uh, the Eagles have great run stats. But then last week, Kansas City really, uh, really ran the ball well against them. So I don't know if they're if they're as good as their stats or not. I don't know if it means they have to load up the box to really be good against the run. I didn't quite know what to make of that in Kansas City last week. And then I think an interesting decision for both defensive play callers is do you, do you keep one of your linebackers as a spy for the quarterback? Yeah. Um, two weeks ago, the, the Bills played around with it a little bit with Russell Wilson, and, and Russell still was able to convert a couple things. Uh, and he, he scrambles at a last resort now. Yeah. Um, so do you keep Dorian Williams, the rookie linebacker, do you sort of keep him anchored in the middle uh, to keep an eye on Hurts? If you're the Eagles, do you put one of your linebackers – to keep an eye on Josh Allen, who ran more keepers last week than he had in yeah, the previous I games. Yeah. So and so that would be a Joe Grady wrinkle. So I, I here's stating the complete and utter obvious: the quarterback play is going to be the key. But to boil it down right. even more, the quarterback run play is going to be uh, pretty critical. I wanted to ask you one thing about Josh Allen before I let you go. If I can find my notes here, let's see um, the interceptions this year. I believe he has 12. Uh, yep, um, 12, tied for first. Are, there's interceptions and there's interceptions. Are these interceptions that are bouncing off people's hands and going to defensive backs, or are they, or is he making bad decisions? Well, it's it's uh, some of everything. Um, you, know, if, you know, what's the old phrase? Every turnover has a story. Well, mm -hmm. that's a particularly true with Josh. 
he's had at least, I want to say three or four where it was a third and long and it was kind of like a punt. Yeah. yeah. I still don't like that play because you're sort of giving up on the play and giving up on the possession. But he had, he had, he's had a couple, the concerning part for, for the bills is he's had a couple of interceptions that have looked alike. It was the first play against New England safety baited him, picked it off Mm -hmm. interception against Denver end of the first half. Safety played up top. He didn't see it, which allowed the corner to undercut the route. It's like, dude, you, you, you should be seeing that stuff. At this point in your career, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and he sort of admitted that. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and really, when you have three interceptions in week one, you're sort of chasing the season in terms of getting out of that uh, pole position. Right, yeah, but, exactly. Uh, yeah. But you look at – and one thing I'll defend Josh on is Patrick Mahomes is at 11 interceptions. So, he certainly is. Yes. Yeah. So these are guys. These are I mean, these are gunslingers. Yeah. There's going to be some Sundays they keep both teams in the game, and yeah. Uh, yeah. so, uh, but that's going to be obviously going to be important on Sunday. All right. Well, Ryan, I'll let you get back to work here, and I hope you have a good trip down to our city and everything goes well for you. Say hi to Josh Barnett, your sports editor, a guy oh. I enjoyed working with for several years, and still. Uh, Still keep in touch with. I also talked to uh, Derek Boyko yesterday, by the way. On okay. yeah. It's good to, good to, uh, uh, too bad I won't be there Sunday because I like seeing Derek, but, uh, you know, um, have a good time and I hope, uh, you know, the season goes well and I hope it's not over. Yeah. Well, a couple, of, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up on this. A couple of people emailed me says, if, if, if you're wrong, I'm going to remind you. And I have my back. I oh, said, they will. I said, please do. I said, yeah. I'll own it. But I had a lot more people saying, hey, I agree with you. So, yeah. uh, so, but hey, as we know, just keep it interesting. Right. Absolutely, Ryan. And you do a good job of that. So that's Ryan O'Halloran from the Buffalo News. We're going to go to commercial and then we'll have EJ Smith from the Inquirer to talk about the Eagles this week. In our family, food is our daily bond. My nonna, affectionately called mama by many, found solace and joy in the kitchen sharing her love through delicious creations. She turned her culinary passion into a flourishing business alongside her husband and sons in 1983. Celebrating 40 years is a testament to our exceptional team, friends, family, and beloved customers. With gratitude, we look forward to the future, expanding our brand to share the highest quality Italian food and wine nationwide. Our heartfelt thanks to everyone who has played a part in our story. Grazie mille. Royal Billiard and Recreation, proudly celebrating 40 years and our new, bigger showroom. Twice the size and twice the fun. More pool tables by Olhausen. More dartboard sets, including custom-reclaimed backboards. More bar and kitchen stools that can change a room. And more bars, including pre-built and custom. Hot tubs, skee-ball, shuffleboard, outdoor, and fun. Royal Billiard and Recreation, your ultimate game room store. Now located on Bethlehem Pike in Colmar. And we're back for the second half of Bowen on the Birds on the Friday after Thanksgiving here in the Delaware Valley. And we have E.J. Smith from the Inquirer, my old colleague, or not my old, I'm his, I'm his old. He's my <laughs> I'm getting old too, Les, honestly. Young. I'm getting up there. <laughs> how was Thanksgiving, E.J.? How you doing? It was, it was good. Th- thanks for having me, Les. I appreciate it. How was your Thanksgiving? Very quiet, but nice. And, uh, yeah. you know, all is well. And, uh. I was saying uh, at the top of the show, it's so weird. We waited around so long after that Dallas game for the Eagles to play again. And now it seems like this game is is coming at us uh, a little too quickly. Uh, it seems like uh, just a couple of days ago that the Eagles played, and, and that's because they did. Uh, so what what's preparation like this week for the Bills? Uh, what's What can you tell me about the injury situation? Uh, I knew Milt Williams – concussion do we expect milton to be able to play uh what do you know yeah so first to the the weirdness of this week <clears throat> you know it's it is you're right like they had the bye week and now they have a short week coming right off of it and then you compound that with the holiday so coming into the season i actually thought this had all the makings of a trap game for the eagles just because of the fact you're coming off the most anticipated game of the regular season really across the entire nfl you know a super bowl rematch on monday night and 
you go you go to this Bills game, and you, next week you've got the 49ers, an NFC championship rematch. And I'm sure, you know, listen, it's human nature. I'm sure some of these guys are looking ahead to that a little bit. So the preparation's weird this week. You know, the, the team was in yesterday. Um, they didn't have availability. Uh, but, and, you know, they had the guys in early. <clears throat> you know, I, I think the sense I got today is they got in around 730 and they were out by noon. So oh, they had a little bit of a shorter day yesterday. But, yeah, you're really only getting two full practices because of the fact that they're coming off the Monday night game. Um, and, you know, Nick Sirianni favors the walkthroughs uh, this time of the year. Yeah. So definitely limited practice time. Um, on the injury stuff, uh, Justin Evans, I didn't see him out there today. He's uh, coming back from this knee injury. And, yeah, you're. I don't – I mean, I didn't see Milton Williams out there today. We'll see what the injury report looks like. But, I mean, you can read between the lines on this concussion protocol stuff. When a guy's not out there, you know, these guys right. have to be – limited and then they have to be full it really takes a lot on a short week it's really hard right um, to come out of the concussion protocol so i'd expect them to be without him as well okay so big news today on uh derek barnett uh no longer yeah. with us i kind of thought i saw yesterday's injury report and that he was still sitting at home uh for personal reasons and i thought they're not gonna you know they don't like pay, paying guys to just sit around and not uh, practice or play um, so sure enough, today's released. Were you surprised at all? And do you think anybody's going to pick him up on waivers? Um, first off, I wasn't surprised. Kind of what you said, like the writing was on the wall, you know, all season. It's been obvious that he wanted a bigger role that then the Eagles were able to offer him. And honestly, his production didn't back up what he was asking for. Um, I think he's got three sacks in the last two seasons. He didn't have any sacks this year. Um, really was just not productive this year. So, um, you know, do I think a team will pick him up? I mean, maybe, but I also think the Eagles have definitely, I mean, listen, he, he had permission to seek a trade before the season. Yeah. Um, you know, he came out of training camp unhappy with the role he was in. And the Eagles said, if you can find somebody to, to pick you up, then we'll trade you. So I don't doubt that they had, that they made calls on him. Now, maybe it's different when a guy gets waived. Now, you know, the contract's a little bit different. You know, he had a contract that went through next year. Now he would just be on a one-year deal, um, assuming that he clears waivers and then a team can sign him, which I would imagine that's probably where he's headed. So I think, you know, team, teams will see the novelty of a former first-round pick, you know, a guy who has played a lot of football for the Eagles. You know, he's yep. obviously had a decreasing role, but I could see him on a team, but I don't see him being like a, a main fixture of anybody's pass rush at this point in the year. Really strange career, I believe. Yeah. That rookie year, you know, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, there was there were no complaints about Derek Barnett. He didn't win rookie of the year or anything, but he was very solid. He got some sacks. He recovered a fumble in the Super Bowl that was one of yeah. the biggest plays in Eagles history. Um, he didn't create the play, but he was there, and he made the recovery very, very smoothly. Um, you know, coming out of that year, you thought they had done – very well drafting Derek Barnett 14th overall. Yeah. And then his career never, never developed, never. In fact, it went downhill pretty much. Right. Yeah. Still. I mean, he, he was like, you know, five, six sacks a season for the first four years. And then just completely, you know, I don't want to say completely fell off a cliff, but steadily declined from there. And, you know, sort right. of never really made a claim on that starting role as guys sort of started to filter in and out. Honestly, Josh Sweat became the guy that you thought that Derek Barnett had a chance to be. Right. You know, and, and of uh, course, Josh was players. not yeah. drafted real high, but yeah. that was because of his knee. Right. You know, I, yeah. I think Josh Sweat coming out of high school was one of the top two or three players at any position in the country. You know, yeah. so it wasn't a shock that Josh Sweat became a good player. It might be a shock that his knee is held up. But right. uh, with Derek Barnett, there was all this talk in the draft process about his bend. His, his ability to turn the corner at a really low angle because his ankles would, you know, let him do that. And I thought at the time, you know, is that really like a big deal? Ankle injuries, guys right. get older. It's the kind of move that if you know that's what the guy's doing and he's parallel to the ground, you can just kind of get on top of him and, and right. take him down. You know, it's not like it's unbeatable or anything. Um, I, I don't know what to to make of what happened with Derek. The the penalties were, yeah, that's what most fans noted about his career. As yeah. as Nick Sirianni once said, it's always him. <laughs> right. 
And he never had you in the early years. We used to talk to him about that, and he never really grasped, you know, that hey, I need to change. Yeah, and I think there, I think there's a there's an expression in, that I've heard from coaches before that you need a few rats on every ship, right? Like you know, yeah. you kind of have to have the bad apples in with the good on a football team. And I think at times, like you could you could sense that there was a an internal appreciation for Derek Barnett, even though he was an undisciplined player. Because maybe, maybe that, head, you know, yeah, I, I think yeah. that, you know, every, I think coaches do value that. And I think that maybe speaks to his longevity, even though he was undisciplined and had a reputation as a, for a, to be a, he had a reputation as a dirty player uh, for yeah. parts in his career, for sure. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that, again, maybe there's a little bit of, you need guys like that. Um, you know, I know he's, he's had games where, he, you know, Nick Sirianni was really impressed with the way that he played, but I really do, especially, you know, as this team evolves and that they start to bring in some younger guys I mean, listen, like, I don't, I don't think Jalen Carter's really like the type of guy who plays with like an edge in an undisciplined way. But I think, I mean, you see that guy, he has an insane motor. You know, this guy's like yeah. someone who's throwing people around, you know, through the whistle and stuff like that. So very physical. I mean, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that the team sort of has evolved to a point where you don't need a guy like Derek Barnett. I mean, you've got Hassan Reddick and Josh Wett as the starters, you've got Nolan Smith, you could have Brandon Graham as rotational pieces. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it makes sense that he kind of got phased out because. I also think like there are moments this season where he was really close to having things boil over and cost the team. Um, I think oh. it was against the Jets. Um, after a field goal, he was mixing it up with a couple of players and ended up kind of getting in the referee's face too. So, you know, there were definitely a couple of moments where it's like he's on the edge like he always is. And yeah. yeah, I think with the team as talented as it is and the guys who are ahead of him, it just didn't really make sense to put him in those positions anymore. Very well said. Let's talk about this week's game and the Bills. Uh, I was talking to Ryan O'Halloran right before you. Uh, Bills are a team I have a hard time figuring out. They're six and five, but they've outscored opponents by 104 points. Um, (laughs) Right. Ryan declared their season over a couple weeks ago when they lost to Denver. That's something I have some experience with, and it never works when you (laughs) you do that. It's like a – you know, it's like jinxing a no hitter or something. You you just uh, when the minute you say the season's over, <laughs> there they go. You know, um, what do you think of the Bills? Yeah, they're I, they're a tough team to figure out. I honestly think that like the injuries on their defense have really changed the complexion of the team. They're one of those teams when you start to really dig into it, it's like, geez, they're missing a lot of the guys who I would have pointed to and said, man, that that guy's a handful. You know, whether it's Somebody like Matt Milano or um, shoot, I've, I've got his Tredavious uh, White. Yeah, Tredavious White. Um, you know, even like Taylor Raps out this week. I think that that's something that's like going to cost them. So they definitely are missing a lot of guys. I mean, their their secondary is really banged up. I think that that's a big part of what's made them so good. And I mean, I mentioned Milano first because I think that they really are going to miss him. I think both as a you know cover cover linebacker, but also especially against the run. I feel like. You know, I think that there's something like 14th against the run in DVOA mm-hmm. this year. I think that number is going to go down. You know, I think that they're going to continue to struggle without him. So, yeah, I mean, I think that injuries have really depleted them on defense. And I think offensively, they just really haven't been able to figure out what works for them. You know, it's just funny. Right. You know, you got Josh Allen. You, you would expect, you know, them to be able to figure this out. But, I mean, Allen's at a place right now where he's turned the ball over a lot. I think some of it's overstated. You know, I know, uh, you know, some of it's like arm punts, uh, you know, to me, right. like, Ryan you know, made that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was about to say, like, I feel like there are times on third and long where it's like, well, you know, take a shot. Maybe they catch it. Maybe it's an interception yeah. and you, you're giving up field position the same way you would if uh, it was a punt. But, you know, as far as like this game for the Eagles, I know you mentioned it's a must win. I, I don't know if I'd go so far as a must win, but I do think it's in a really important game. You know, I was watching the Cowboys yesterday and I'm thinking or, you know, I was even the 49ers. It's like, I mean, it's a two game lead over the division or the conference. Right. So Mm -hmm. that literally all that's good for is if you lose to the bills and you lose to the 49ers next week, they're no longer in the, they're no longer in the driver's seat for the number one seat. Right. Um, So I think that that is the overarching point here about the bills game is that like a win would keep them in the driver's seat, even if they can't beat the 49ers, the Cowboys, if you think that they're going to drop one of those games, all of a sudden it's like, all right, well now the number one seat is in, in contention. And honestly, the Eagles, I think they've outperformed the the way they've played this year. I I mean, it's hard yeah. to nitpick with a nine and one team, but you also look at some of their underlying metrics and some of the things that are going on beneath the surface, and you think they're nine and one, but they might be more like a seven and three team right now. So 
you know, if they do have a regression to the mean, getting that cushion is going to be huge. So definitely understand what you're saying about the, um, you know, the must win nature of this game, because it really does. The complexion can change. They're in a great spot. They've earned that great spot, but they have to hang on to it. Because right. um, especially if you look at the playoffs this year, like it's not going to be like last year where you're playing the Giants you get in the, the divisional round. The, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, because the way it's shaping up, the Cowboys are going to be the fifth seed. And if the mm-hmm. Cowboys are the lowest seed going into the, into the division round, even if you're the one seed, the Cowboys aren't going to be a tough – or the Cowboys aren't going to be an easy uh, easy opponent in the divisional right. round. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think they got to keep their foot on the gas this week. You know, I don't buy this as much of a, as a trap game. I think they could come out flat, but I do, I do think the Eagles have enough talent advantages where they should be able to win this game, and they should win this game. All righty. Hey, we got to go to commercial on the other side. I want to get to Robert Gilker's question there, which is uh, – does this uh, Derek Barnett business open up a roster spot for Shaq Leonard, perhaps? Yeah. But uh, we'll talk about that after this last commercial break. Hats.com is the premier destination for quality and fashion forward hats and more with designs for every style and trend. Locally based and run by Philly sports team fanatics, Hats.com can help you elevate your hat jaw. Utilize the easy-to-use guides at Hats.com to find your perfect size and style. And shipping and returns are free. Hats.com. Find yourself in a hat. Use code Philly for 15% off your order. Hats.com. Royal Billiard and Recreation proudly celebrating 40 years and our new bigger showroom. Twice the size and twice the fun. More pool tables by Olhausen. More dartboard sets, including custom reclaimed backboards. More bar and kitchen stools that can change a room. And more bars, including pre built and custom. Hot tubs, ski ball, shuffleboard, outdoor, and fun. Royal Billiard and Recreation, your ultimate game room store. Now located on Bethlehem Pike in Colmar. And we're back for the final segment of this week's Bowen on the Birds with E.J. Smith from the Philadelphia Inquirer, who is uh, weathering the ups and downs of this extremely weird Eagle season uh, very well, I think. He's written some some excellent pieces. Uh, let's do what Robert Gilchrist was asking, and let's uh, po- ponder whether that roster spot could be Shaq Leonard. Um, I certainly think it could be. I don't think that the Barnett waving – is like a Has signal that something's that. imminent. Yeah. yeah, I think that they weighed Barnett more because of Barnett. Um, but the, the Shaq Leonard stuff is interesting. Nick Sirianni knows him very well, and he's got a good relationship with Shane Steichen, obviously. So I think that the Eagles have the most information on him of anybody. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm of two minds of it, honestly. I know that that's not always the most uh, you know that's all right. <laughs> definitive way to do this. But, um, you know, I think that, of course, the Eagles are always going to get linked to guys like this because, yeah. like, and especially they have a need at the position. So it makes a lot of sense why you would say the Eagles would be interested, which is what's out there right now. Um, but I also think it makes a lot of sense. I think the only question, the two things that I'm like, that I, I get hung up on. Number one is like, this guy was clearly not in the favor of Shane Steichen to the right. point where, you know, they originally said, oh, you're not going to play early. You're not going to play uh, on third down anymore because, you know, we don't trust you in coverage. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, and you're also not going to play early downs because we've got better options against the run. It's like, so he really was effectively benched in, right. in Indianapolis. And Indianapolis has pretty good linebacker play, so I think that's part of it. Um, I think the the thing that Shaq Leonard's going to have to decide if he wants to sign with the Eagles is, is he okay not having a big role in Philly either? Right. Because I don't think it's a given that he would come in and start over Nicholas Morrow and Zach Cunningham. Right. Um, Absolutely. Like, yes. Yeah. Nicholas Morrow and Zach Cunningham did not have their best game against the Chiefs. Nicholas Morrow in particular, I thought, had a couple mm-hmm. of like run fits and run blitzes that really backfired against the Eagles. But again, I'm not sure it's a given that Shaq Leonard would just come in and be a starter. So okay. um, and if he has a chance to do that somewhere else, maybe he values that more. But yeah, I definitely think that, you know, this is the Howie Roseman. Uh, it's like uh, always applicable is that he's going to do his due diligence on this guy. And I do think that there, it makes sense that they would have some interest. So again, I don't think they wave Barnett because Shaq Leonard is on a flight yeah. to Philadelphia or anything like that, but I could see it, especially because when I look at the guys that are coming off of IR, you know, eligible to come off it's Quez Watkins and it's Justin Evans. Now Evans, I haven't seen him at practice, so I don't really think right. he's really a candidate. Uh, Quez maybe, but I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he needs another week, you know, it's hamstring right. injury. It's a second hamstring injury of the season. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, they don't need to rush him back. They're not in a position where they're desperate for him. So Absolutely. they don't have a lot of IR candidates right now that it makes sense for that spot. So 
if uh, Shaq Leonard is willing to rotate with the likes of Nicholas Morrow and Zach Cunningham, mm-hmm. then I could see it happening. But yeah. I think that's going to be a, a decision uh, that both of the both of the Eagles and Shaq Leonard are, are going to have to make. Right. Yeah, I have a couple more things I want to get to here real quickly, but I do think uh, with Leonard, I'm just thinking long term, if you get him here, is he permanently disabled, but not disabled, but permanently diminished yeah. after these two back surgeries? Or is this just the year after these two back surgeries and next year he's going to be that all pro guy again? Yeah, and once point. you get him in the building, I you know I, I think that's worth looking at. But who knows? Anyway, I have a bone to pick with you, sir. Oh no! <laughs> so you wrote this story about uh, about Brian Johnson and Nick. You know, oh, he's doing a phenomenal job. And of course, you can't write the story and say that Nick didn't say that because that's what he said. But these stats, you brought up a couple stats, and you were like, well. They were ninth. They were second in this last year, but now they're ninth. So there's really no difference. Or they were th- they were third last year, and now they're ninth. And so there's no difference. Now I don't want to sound like Ricky Bobby's father here, but <laughs> second is over here, and ninth is over here. Yeah, that those are not the same thing to me. And I think this is, if anything, a more talented offense than last year. And I don't see why. There should be any drop off from what they did last year statistically. So I, I, if it was worded in a way that made it sound like I was suggesting that they were the same, then I, you are absolutely right. You definitely have a bone to pick with me. I was trying to give those numbers as kind of the balancing act to what Nick was saying. Yeah. So maybe you know I got to go okay. back and you know I that, that's it. all right. Yeah. That's an Andy Reid. I gotta, I gotta do a better job of that because that is true. I agree. Like they are not the same. Um, their point production's down. All of their numbers are slightly worse, and there are a couple metrics that are like significantly apart. So, um, to your point, like I do think that the offense is more talented, but I think Jalen Hurts has been hobbled a little bit more. Although I guess, listen, he's been playing really well through the injury. So I'm and not even playing better teams. Sure, and, but I'm not that. here to make excuses for Brian Johnson. Yeah. I really was writing. Listen, a lot of people are criticizing him, and Nick Sirianni is saying that he thinks it's not talked about the job he's done. I mean, I think that the offense has been more predictable this year. Um, yeah. But what I would – the only thing I guess I would push back on is I don't think it's just Brian Johnson because some of these things were Nick Sirianni things, yeah. you know. You know, I bring up the lack of hot reads, and that's right. the Nick Sirianni thing. Yeah, that's Nick's – that's – And what in the world is the justification for that? Right. I honestly have no idea. Um, and that is – that's Nick's offense. And I think that's yeah. – I think it's a, it's a tough job to be the Eagles offensive coordinator sometimes because you're running Nick's scheme and there are going to be times where Nick's on the headset saying, run this. And, yeah. you know, he gets, and he gets a lot of the credit also when it goes well, cause it's his scheme. So, um, but I, I listen, I'm, I'm not here to really play defendant for Brian Johnson. Okay. I think there are times where the offense has been predictable. Um, but I, I do think the, the, the problems in the offense are more, representative of the whole I think some of these yeah. you know quarterback draws I think that that might be a pre-snap check you know I think that that might be something that Jalen gets into okay. I remember earlier in the season there was a third down late in the game where they they threw a pat they threw a shot to AJ instead of just running it and running the clock I think it was against Washington yeah and you know you could read between the lines of the, what the coaches said that that was Jalen going hey let's take a shot here so yeah. I think some of it could be Jalen I think some of it's Nick I do think some of it's Brian but especially that reliance on the screen game, I remember that from Nick's first year. Yeah. Like there were times where it was like, man, they're throwing a lot of screens. It's like they're just playing that box count where it's like, oh, well, we've got numbers to the outside. We have to throw a bubble screen. And that has never made sense to me. And you, you see it bite them at times. So, um, so yeah, I do think that there are some problems with the offense. But ultimately, I, I'm, I think it's more of an aggregate problem than just on Brian Johnson. Right. Well, Nick and the whole uh, motion thing, it drives yeah. me crazy when he gives that answer – we're not going we to do motion, just, to do just be yeah. doing motion. Well, who the hell does? Right. You know, if you ask a team that does a lot of motion, why do you do motion? They're not going to say, well, you know, we just do that to, to be doing it. We're not really yeah. trying to get anything out of it. or <laughs> Right. No, you know, that's stupid. What? Ah, but uh, yeah, your point, we're running out of time here, but your point about the, the way they're winning is really something I definitely wanted to get to with you. Uh these last two games, they have basically said to the other team, okay, we're going to lie down over here and you go ahead and win the game. 
and those teams couldn't do it. And so the Eagles won. You can't go on like this. I mean, they keep, I say this every time and then they do it again, but you can't go on like this. It's just ridiculous expecting people to drop passes or commit penalties or, you know, do other things after you've just put yourself in an untenable situation is no way to win. Yeah, I agree. Cause you know, people will say, Oh, well, they just keep finding ways to win. I, I, I try to remind people every team that wins a lot of one score games says, Oh, we just find ways to win. We just, you know, are gritty and we, we are tough yeah, and we never right. give up. Those are all like these things that aren't quantifiable in the way that te- the, the way that it is teams that, have that win a lot of one score games almost always regress. Now, listen, yep. that could take a year or two to really come right. up and, you know, eventually get to them. But I do think that it's not their point differential is just not what it was last year. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's not what it was last year. Um, and the way these games have gone, they don't feel like they felt last year. So, no. you know, again, they're nine and one, they're in a good spot, but listen, if we're sitting here in three weeks and we're talking about them, you know, in a much different situation, then I think we will be able to look back at this stretch and go, well, they haven't really been dominating games. Um, so I don't know. It's like, it is weird to, to have like nitpicks against a nine and one team, but you know, it's my job to have the nuanced conversations and like the context. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> nationally, you hear a lot of that about Eagles fans aren't happy with, you know, nearly perfect. But if you watch the games, I mean, yeah. no, it's uh it's just exasperating. I, there was a thing today. One of the radio shows had a poll about which uh, which team, which opponent coming up should the should Eagles fans be scared of? You know, and I was like, yeah, they shouldn't be scared of any of them because the Eagles have as much talent or more talent than any of these teams. And uh, right. uh, someone who on Twitter that I see a lot, uh, Real Mama Eagle, uh, she had yeah. the best answer for that. She said. The Eagles. The Eagles are the team that Eagles fans should be most scared of. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's an excellent point because that's really all this comes down to is if they play their best football, they're the most talented team in the league, in my opinion. That's exactly right. But we just haven't yeah. seen it. And you get to a point where you start wondering if you're going to see it. Yeah, right. So defensively, are things getting back on track here with, uh, you know, the, the things have settled down in the secondary a little bit and – uh, how, how do you feel about that? I mean, I, I think Sean Desai is making adjustments and doing, you know, he's done a good job, I think, uh, given yeah. that he's had many more things to deal with than Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni on the other side, you know, and I, I they've had their, their problems, but it's been more or less okay. Yeah, I wrote about that earlier this week where I said, like, listen, yes. I'm off the Sean Desai roller coaster. Like, you know, I felt like he, because I, I feel like after the Miami game, I was con, I was very encouraged to say like this guy can put together a game plan in a playoff game that keeps you in a game or you know is successful even against an elite offense. And then the Cowboys game and the Washington game happens, and it's like, all right, is this guy really going to be the type of guy who can do that? After the way that the defense played against the Chiefs, I'm off the roller coaster. Like there are going to be games this year where the Eagles defense gives up 30 plus points. It's going to happen. It could happen this Sunday. But I think at the very least, like I, I can say with confidence that the defensive coordinator has shown that he can game plan against the elite quarterbacks, the elite offenses, and at least give your team a shot. Um, Cause you know, like those, those elite offenses, they are going to score 30 points at times. You know, there are going to be right. weeks yeah. where they have your number, but you know, the thing with Jonathan Gannon that people would rightfully complain about is you knew that the defense was going to underperform against these really, really good quarterbacks. So you're right. Sean Desai tries things. He's creative. He has, in, he you know, makes in-game adjustments. They're one of the best second half defenses in the NFL this year. And Absolutely. I think that's a big part because he is, he has a good feel for the game. So, um, you know, there are going to be weeks where it looks like it does against the chiefs where they, you know, keep them to a low, low point total and honestly get a little bit fortunate at times. Although I, I, they were fortunate, but at the same time, I think that, you know, Sean Desai's game plan was to make the Chiefs receivers beat them. And, you know, I think that that needs to be baked in a little bit. Yeah, Yeah. the drops were almost like part of what he was expecting to happen. So, um, you know, there are going to be weeks where they they give up a lot of points, but there are also going to be weeks that are like the Chiefs game or even the Cowboys game where they're opportunistic and they close out the game after, you know, struggling a lot earlier in the game. So, yeah, I definitely think the defense – at the very least, I think that they're going to be able to keep the keep the team in the game as long as the offense is playing the way it's supposed to play. Because, um, yeah, I do. I think Sean Desai's done a nice job so far. 
That's nicely said, and uh, I agree with everything there. And we're at the end of our hour uh, at Bowen on the Birds, and I sure hope uh, the weekend goes well for you, EJ, and that the game goes well. It's another 425 start. Ooh. I kind of like those. You have stuff you can do in the morning. You can go for a run or something. And, I'm not a fan. I, I miss my one o'clock starts, Les. We've only had two of them this year. Only yeah, one. Yeah, but you know, home. everything yeah. you write is is old by the next yeah. morning. You that's know, that's fair. that's my biggest thing with one o'clock starts. It is a lot easier to get your thoughts together and have sure. some time. Yeah. But you know, I was never much of a thinker anyway. So neither am I. Yeah, didn't me bother me yeah. too much. <laughs> But we'll be back next week with Bowen on the Birds. We thank E.J. Smith and Ryan O'Halloran once more for bearing with us here. Thanks for having me, Les.